Hey everyone, GC Smith here, and it is Magic the Gathering spoiler season once again, this time for Khans of Tarkir. PAX Prime was uh, yesterday, or is ongoing, but yesterday they released various new spoilers for Khans of Tarkir, and I guess I really should just start right now with the most exciting one, the one which will be most important for many of you players out there, and probably the most exciting one, especially for Eternal players. Fetches are being reprinted. This is 100% confirmed from the sources of PAX Prime. Onslaught allied fetches, at least, have been confirmed. This is amazing news. Um, as a standard player who's wanted to get into modern, uh, this is just the best news because not only does this mean I'll have access to fetches uh, in modern for a reasonable price, hopefully this will bring down the other fetch lands. A lot of the fetch lands in modern, um, some of them are only so high, not because they're actually useful in the decks they go in. Um, a lot of decks are using off-color fetches just to fetch one or two shock lands they run in the deck. Uh, not really uh, for the purpose of them fixing those colors. For instance, you might see a blue-white deck run the blue-red fetch land, for example, uh, because they can still fetch the hallowed fountain from it. But they, you know, I'm imagining they would rather run a blue-white fetch land, which will be possible. So the decks that are running fetch lands off color because they're the only fetch lands available to them will stop using them, and this will drive prices down. But also, it will kind of reverse the situation of the non-onslaught, uh, the sorry, the reprinted onslaught fetches uh, being used as off-color fetches in uh, the decks were originally originally using on-color fetches because maybe you can't get access to the on-color fetches. Now, with these five confirmed, I would say that by the end of Khan's attack here, we would expect the uh, Zendikar fetches to come back. Um, the main reason for this one being they like having equal fixing across an entire block for Block Constructed. Though with Block Constructed no longer being a Pro Tour format, Maybe and maybe not. Uh, the only other reason I think they would put it in block is the way the new block, um, the new rotating block format in standard, which I will cover in another video, hopefully soon, um, means they'll probably want all the fetches to rotate in one go. Now, I don't really want to get into the specifics of why fetches are good also in standard, um, not just like eternal formats. Uh, and I know there will be some of you out there who think these are just glorified evolving wilds that you pay one life for. Um, but they are much more than that. Um, now, many of you say, well, that's because they interact with shocks, which are rotating when these come out. Um, but I would definitely say they're going to see a lot of play, uh, especially in standard. Um, and I will explain this basically being, is there the best amount of fixing you can have on lands? Much better than tricolor lands, much better than Skylands, uh, just for color fixing. And that's not to say they're not, or at least they're 100% better than Skylands, or better than any other dual land or tri land will use. It's more that they are just better at fixing. Skylands also provide the scry, which you may value more in a deck that doesn't need so much fixing. So it really depends on what you want. But I'm definitely really excited about this change. Fetchlands coming down in price, Fetchlands being useful again. Well, useful in standard. Uh, but also just having fetch lands, I'm just so excited to be playing with these things. I've never had a chance to play with them, and I'm just going to be so glad to play with them. Now, the fetch land discussion is out of the way. Let's cover the rest of the spoilers that have been coming out for Khans of Tarkir. Not maybe as exciting as fetches, or maybe to a lot of you, maybe more exciting than fetches. Maybe you're a limited player. Who knows? But let's start off, and the first card we're going to be covering is a card called Dune Blast. This is a six, uh, oh, seven converting mana cost, four colorless white, black, green, sorcery. Choose up to one creature, destroy the rest. This is a board wipe for seven mana that allows you to save one of your own creatures. Not a terrible card. Um, it is a rare. I can't really see this seeing much play, unfortunately. It's just... I don't know. We've got Fate of Retribution, 7 mana, which is instant speed within the white colours and destroys Planeswalkers. Um, I'm not sure how much plays we'll see. Uh, maybe if you've, you're running a Planeswalker heavy deck, possibly. Um, and maybe if you've got like a really important creature you need to save now that we're not going to have a filling or anything like that in the format. Might see play. 
though it will be a big stretch. Next up we have what I believe is the Khan for the Jeskai, the American Colored Guild this time. Uh, Narset Enlightened Master. Six mana, uh, three colorless, blue, red, white. Legendary creature, human monk. This is a mythic rare. With first strike, hexproof, and whenever Narset Enlightened Master attacks, exile the top four cards of your library. Until end of turn, you may cast non-creature cards exiled and Narset this turn without paying their mana costs. And she's a 3-2. So... Oof, this is a really hard card to evaluate. Now... The first card I want to compare this to is going to be Guides to Sync Draft. It's a similar feel to Guides to Sync Draft in that it gives you value when attacking. Now, the difference with this card is it's six mana, uh, which is a massive difference. A six mana, it's a three mana gap, and this is color, more color intensive. Um, and it doesn't give you an angel. It doesn't give you like that immediate value. It can only give you value if you actually exile something of value with it. In the white deck, I can see it being good, and I can see it being a good commander card. It's insanely good for commander card, because I've been wanting to say build an Is it card, and you've had um, the Is it Guild, uh, Is it Maze Runner, uh, who allow Melek, that allows you to cast cards on the top of your library and copy them. This card, I think, is slightly better, in my opinion, for that kind of role, because you get access to white, which is amazing. Um, but it really depends what uh, non-creature cards we're going to have in this. Now, I do like the fact it's non-creature. I like the fact that uh, the Jeskai are all about non-creature cards, not instants and sorceries, which is a big difference. Being able to cast Planeswalkers this way for free is actually quite possibly good. Actually, I only just consider that. the planes, I can cast Planeswalkers, red, blue, white Planeswalkers for free. Okay, there's not necessarily many. You don't actually have to stick to red, blue, white. You can run this in a five-color five deck. I was going to say six, which isn't true. Um... I'm not really sure if this card will actually be any good. Uh, first right through, I don't know. It's a hard card to evaluate. Definitely a commander card. Standard, possibly. But I really, again, a bit like June Blast. Uh, it is going to be a bit of a maybe. But I don't, I, overall, I don't think you'll see much play. The next up, though, is a card I definitely think we'll see play. And here we have the Poster Boy Planeswalker for this set. Sarkin, the Dragon Speaker. It's basically been confirmed at this point, uh, given uh, some stories they put up on the website, that he isn't just mad. He is actually hearing the voice of Olgin drawing him to Tarkir to open a door, which I find interesting. Um, and this guy is just insane. Now, I had discussions with my friends about this, actually, before, and everyone was like, oh, he's going to be dual-coloured. You know, you had Sark and Vol, you had Sark and the Mad, both of which were two colours. And I was sitting there thinking, well, yeah, but Magic has a lot of patterns. The two-core set cycle for Planeswalkers before they get replaced, on the whole, Garrick recently was an exception. And there's the pattern of the premier Planeswalker in the first set of a block being monocoloured. Linear on the Veil. Jace, Architect of Thought, Elspeth, Sun's Champion. Now we have Sark and the Dragon Speaker. Mono red, five mana, uh, five mana, three colorless, red, red, four loyalty. And this guy is insane. Uh, uh, I say insane, he's just solid and good. Not let's see, okay, not insane, but really solid, really powerful. The Red Planeswalker I've been waiting for. Plus one. Until end of turn, Sark and the Dragon Speaker becomes a legendary 4-4 red dragon creature with flying, indestructible, and haste. He doesn't lose any loyalty while he's a, not a planeswalker. So this doesn't say he stays a planeswalker, so importantly he stops being a planeswalker while this happens. Which normally would open him up to all sorts of removal. Doomblade, uh, Ultimate Prize, the new, uh, new Soltai Charm, which is a card I'll come to in a minute. But he really doesn't, because he becomes indestructible. And the haste is relevant on the turn you play him. Turns afterwards, not so relevant. But the turn you play him, you can actually attack now on the turn you play with him. And this is really good. Just being able to attack with your Planeswalker, 5 mana for a 4-4 flying indestructible with haste, it's basically Storm Breath Dragon 5-8. And that's ignoring his other two loyalty abilities. We all know how powerful Storm Breath Dragon is. And... Well, okay, Stormbreath Dragon's possibly a little bit more powerful than his plus one because of its monstrous ability and his protection from white, which are both extremely relevant. But 
This is just good for, uh, for a Planeswalker. Now, his minus three, Sarkin the Dragon Speaker deals four damage to target creature, which again is actually rather good. One of the things I was really sad about rotation is the fact that Mizzia Mortis is going to be going out. And yet we'll still have one of the really powerful and I wouldn't say oppressive, but annoying green cards to deal with, Corsa of Crufix. Now, this minus three will definitely help you deal with that. Now, okay, his plus one deals with that because you fly to the top, but sometimes you just want to stop them seeing cards from the top of the library. You want to stop them filtering through the library. You want to stop them trying to draw to an answer to what you've got on the board. And this helps a lot. Okay, he goes down to one loyalty, making him extremely vulnerable, but his minus can protect him, which is also really good. Which is another thing, actually, Planeswalkers need to have when they evaluate them, is can you protect it? The turn you comes down, you turn it into flyer and attack with. If they let the plus one ability resolve, it's going to be extremely hard for them to deal with during their turn, uh, during your turn. And in their turn, the only thing they can deal with it is like downfall. There's going to be very little, unless they print a lot more in uh, Khans, very little targeted Planeswalker removal, which makes him really hard to deal with. And then he becomes indestructible when they're trying to attack. Yeah, he's going to be really nuts hard to deal with. And then he has a minus six. You get an emblem with... At the beginning of your draw step, draw two additional cards. At the beginning of the end step, discard your hand. His minus six ability is a bit interesting, but just remember, it's only minus six. So you only have to plus one in twice to attack with, and then you get this emblem. Now, this emblem is, his ultimate is basically play this in mono red. Like, if you're in mono red, his ultimate's amazing, uh, because especially if you're playing like a burn deck, you're now going to be drawing three cards a turn. That's three possible burn cards a turn. Now, you do discard them, so you can't hold them. But you just fling them at your opponent's face. And without Sphinx's Revenant format, you don't really need to worry about holding up a uh, uh, skull crack so they can't gain life. You just don't need to worry about that. You just burn them, burn them, burn them. Most other decks, his minus three and plus one are all you're going to be using. You're not going to be caring about uh, discarding your hand. You want to be able to maintain a hand in most other decks, other than mono red, aggro, burn, whatever. You're going to be wanting to maintain your hand, so his plus one and minus three are really what you're going to be using. Both of which, though, are really good. And I like the way, actually, the ultimate is easier to hit base, based on the fact they can only really be used in one style of deck, which I also like. Like, he can be played in multiple decks, but if you play him in this style, you get an easy ultimate. Really good. I just can't say enough good things about Sarkon. This is the first Red Planeswalker since I've been playing that I've been excited for. Chandra, eh. This guy, yes, amazing. Will 100% see standard play. Stormbreath Dragon does. This guy will too. And he'll still be in standard when Stormbreath for a dragon rotates. So you're still going to have a dragon available on turn 5, which is all well and good. Next up, we have the Solitary Charm, which I mentioned before. Three mana. Black, green, blue. So bug colours, for those who don't know. Or Solitary, as they call it in uh, Khans. Instant. True, uh, uh, uncommon, by the way, actually. And this is a multimodal card using the new uh, multimodal uh, formatting of cards. So choose one. Destroy target monocolored creature. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Draw two cards, then discard a card. So, this card is good. Just all around good, really good charm. It's either an ultimate price, a enchantment destruction, or draw two cards and discard a card at instant speed. Now, Again, good. It's just good. There's nothing bad about this. You are getting... Okay, you are going to be paying three mana for an ultimate price, if you're trying to ever use it that way. But instead of thinking of it as ultimate price, think of it as an ultimate price that could also be used as enchantment destruction, or three mana enchantment destruction, which is reasonable, that destroys creatures as well, or can be used to filter your deck. Actually, this is a better card filtering, because it's effectively uh, zero difference in cards. Other cards which have done similar things, like Is It Charm, have drawn to, then discard to. Which means you can't use it when you've got an empty hand, or when this is the only card in your hand, you cast it, draw to, then discard both. Which, if you want a card in your hand, you can't do. This one's better because, A, you're not losing card net. You're playing a card, drawing a cut two cards, and discarding cards. So you lose two cards and draw two cards. Whereas the draw two, discard two, kind of loses you three cards in the process. And... If this is any card in your hand, you can, and you're searching for an answer to something that's desperate, like a desperate situation on the board, you can draw into it. So 
Not bad, uh, all around good card. Most of the charms end up being good within their respective formats, even if a little underplayed, like a lot of the charms from Return to Ravnica. All of them were good, just some weren't in decent archetypes. Like the uh, Demir charm. Demir never ended up really being a deck, so never saw play. Uh, next up, we have Temer Ascendancy. This is a three mana enchantment. Green, blue, red. So this is for the rogue decks, for anyone noticing. And obviously, Tima is their name for the clan in Khans. Uh, it's a rare. And it's creatures you control have haste. Whenever a creature of power four, great enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. Now, I really like this card. For one thing, it's given your creatures haste, which you really like in aggressive decks, say, like uh, Rug. Secondly, it gives you card advantage, or over your opponent. You're playing things and getting cards back. So you play this in a deck where you're running, say, Polychronos, Stormbreath Dragon, uh, Arbor Colossus, and maybe a big blue thing. I'm not sure which blue thing you would run, but or just run blue for counters or whatever other things you do. But every time you're playing one of these big creatures you want to be playing, you're drawing a card out of them. Great. And you're getting to attack them in the same turn. So all around, great card. We'll definitely see play if Rug sees play. As long as the rug deck runs creatures. Uh, there's a Planeswalker deck, which is interesting. But even that deck, not necessarily terrible with uh, Teemo Ascendancy. Let, next up, we have Herald of Anna Fenza. Anna Fenza, yeah, that's right. Her Herald of Anna Fenza. A one-drop creature, human soldier. White. So it's just white, one white mana. Rare. With a new, the new ability, or one of the new abilities, a clan ability, outclassed, two colorless, white. So you pay two colorless and white, tap, put a 1-1 one, one counter on this creature. Outlast only as a sorcery. So you can only activate outlast abilities as a sorcery, and as we can see, outlast is a mechanic where you just put a 1-1 one, one counter on it and tap it. So you generally do this at the end of your opponent's turn. For this guy, whenever you activate its Outlast ability, you put a 1-1 one, one white warrior creature token onto the battlefield. And that's a really good flavour because the card art, as you can see, hopefully on the screen, has him blowing a giant horn or summoning the troops. And getting bigger at the same time. This card is great. We'll definitely see play, I think. A card that can grow steadily over the game while giving you other sources of advantage while doing so. I could see a scene play. I may be wrong, but I can definitely see it seen play. And it's a human soldier, so relevant creature types, both of them, even if the creature types it summons aren't relevant, which is really interesting, actually. Notice, he's a soldier, but summons warriors. So, kind of fighting against maybe the artifact they added in M15 that gives plus two plus two based on creature types. Maybe they don't want tribal to be that big of things, so they're trying to stop it being too good. Who knows? Impossible. Next up, we have Dragon Style Twins in this card. I don't know what about it is. This card makes me so, so happy to see it. This is a Jeskai card, by the way, as you'll see, because it has the mechanic prowess later on. But it's a five mana creature, human monk. Three colorless, red, red, and it's a rare. It has double strike and prowess for a three, three body. So five mana for a three, three double strike isn't terrible. Right? No. Amazing. Balls, but it's not terrible either and it has prowess so every time you cast a non-creature spell it gets plus one plus one turn to turn so casting any combat trick gives it plus one plus one in addition to its other combat tricks and it has double strike if just sky bees a thing i think this guy will see play in fact actually i've seen him playing the rug decks the <laughs> the decks that are running team ascendancy you play team ascendancy you play this in other turns you play a combat trick on it or play a planeswalk or you play something else this guy gets bigger and he's just hard to block you have to block this guy and he's got double strike now you play him in a deck say maybe um dagger where you can give him death touch yeah those kind of things are scary you have to block him you can't afford not to because he has double strike and can become big very, very quickly, right? And it gets increasing advantages when you're playing non-combat tricks. If you somehow play Narset, you're casting multiple cards. This is insane, this guy. Woo, this guy's beautiful. Uh, next up. No, so it's beautiful and I definitely see it play. Next up, we have the uh, Dagger 
Khan, the leader of the Dagger Guild. I can't remember the name of the Dagger Guild unless it's uh, uh, got a card named after it elsewhere in here. But we've already seen Zergo Hellmaster. Uh, he was spoiled uh, ages ago. He was spoiled like at the last PAX event or whatever it was. Or uh, No, it wasn't PAX. It was Comic-Con, was it? Was it San Diego Comic-Con, I think it was. But either way, announce him here because he's a spoiler for Khans and we might as well cover him along with everything else. He is a 5-mana, 2-colorless, red, white, black, legendary creature, orc warrior, mythic rare, 7-2, with haste, and Zergo Helm Smasher attacks each combat if able, but it has indestructible as long as it's your turn. Whenever a creature dealt damage by Zergo Helm Smasher dies, this, uh, this turn, put a 1-1 one -one counter on it. So that means if you deal damage to something else and then bolt it, if he didn't die, he then gets a 1-1 one -one later on. It's, it's irrelevant when he dies that turn, as long, uh, the turn it's dealt damage. So as long as it dies the turn it's dealt damage, later on or whatever, he'll get a 1-1 one -one counter. Which is very good. Makes him big. And just, yeah, this guy's great. And yeah, Dagger will probably play him a 7-2 with haste for 5 that gets bigger. Yeah, why not? He's great, has good abilities, and he's impossible to deal with the turn you play him, unless you exile him or whatever, but he's really good. Next up, a new card, Necropolis Fiend. Nine mana, demon, creature demon, so it's a creature with a demon type, seven, black black, with Delve. Now, Delve is a new returning mechanic, and what do I mean by this? Well, technically it is... By the story of magic, or the emphasis of magic, a new mechanic. It was a mechanic added in Future Sight, which is like, these are mechanics we'll do later, and they'll be considered new later, which is why we haven't got many cards of them in this set. We may be one or two, but we're just showing mechanics we can do later. And they've decided to bring this back. Now, if I'm right, this is meant to be going in the bug deck, because they're meant to be getting a new, like, they're meant to be the resource management deck. So this is like a bug card, and yeah, it actually is. It's got the same watermark as the soul tie charm so it's a soul tie card or oh, it's intended for that clan so i'm assuming this will be one of the cards you can get the pre-release which is something else i might cover in another video in more details but delve is basically where you uh, each card you exile from your graveyard when you're paying it uh, when you're playing this reduces its cost by one card so effectively you could pay double black for this guy for a four four flyer with pay x XL X cards from your graveyard, target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. Now his active ability and delve don't really work well together necessarily because you're exiling with your graveyard to play him and then his ability kind of like, eh. But his ability comes into play where if you ever have to like, if you ever play him late game and you've got a lot of mana and yeah, it's not a terrible card. Uh, having someone actually... I can see a scene play if someone play if mill became a thing. So I'm milling like, oh, you the mill eight cards, like breaking for two, mill eight cards, okay, mill eight. Next to, like, you know, your turn two, like, you, they go first, turn two, mill eight cards, my turn two, exile seven of them, play Necropolis Fiend. Might happen. Or mill myself eight cards, play Necropolis Fiend, and I have Reanimator, and... Yeah, maybe a reanimated deck. Actually, I can see this guy seeing play in a reanimated deck where you've got cards you don't want to reanimate their land and stuff like that. You don't care about your grave being in your graveyard. Like, that's the thing. You want ways to make your land and other cards, non-creature cards that you mill, useful. This Delve definitely does that. Uh, this card could see play... It, it's kind of a fine line. He's powerful in the right deck if that deck takes off in the format. However, we currently have uh, uh, that tomb, or whatever it is, the um, thing that, you know, the zero mana, exile their, sacrifice it, exile their graveyard artifact. So, yeah, I don't necessarily think it might see play. Powerful, but no, not... It, it's like Desecration Demon before Ferris came out. Pack Rat before Ferris came out. Powerful cards, just not in the current format. Next up, we have Rattlecore Mystic. Rattleclaw Mystic. Uh, two mana, one and a green. Human Shaman. Creature Human Shaman. Rare. Now, this is the buy a box promo, by the way, with an alternate art. With tap, add gr 
green, blue, or red to your mana pool. So you can't like add more than one mana. It's a really, it's a really good ability. Morph two. So you can play this down for three as a two two creature, or and flip it up for two. When this is turned face up, add green, blue, and red to your mana pool. So add three, and then you can tap it that turn as long as it's the turn after you um played it or if you've got the rug enchantment because it's clearly a rug card this is clearly a Tima card Tima is it Tima? yeah it's Tima not Fema I don't know why Fema stuck in my head this is definitely a Tima card though it's a mana dork there's no question about that he's generating mana it's a mana dork but a good one why? morph and again I really want to do another video why I think the morph mechanic's great but I definitely think this card will see play um Better than Elvish Mystic, I think, for mana fixing. Not necessarily for mana ramping, you might want to be able to play a course of turn two. But for mana fixing, this guy is insane. And I think if you have Rug with Fetch Lands, Scry Lands, this guy, Corsa, and everything else, your mana's going to be fixed for days. Oh, and carried it. Yeah, your mana's going to be fixed for days. Rug are going to have really reliable mana going to this format if it sees play. It's kind of scary. Next up, we have Ivory Tusk format. Uh, Ivory Tusk Fortress, not format, Fortress. Creature, Elephant. Is this the first elephant they've ever had in the game? I'm not sure. Possibly not. Uh, this is probably where I have like an annotation in the video go, no, the other elephant is this. I like this card. He's a five mana. Two white, black, green. Uh, junk elephant. With untap each creature you control. With a plus one, plus one counter on it during each opponent, other player's untap step. Five, seven. So, let's see. For five mana, you get a five, mana, uh, five, seven body. Good. That's a really good body. Who also allows you to untap your creatures that have one, one counters on them in each opponent's up step. Uh, uh, untap step. Not necessarily. So, uh, let's compare this to the only other card you've got, you've got in the format, which does a similar thing. And that is Prophet of Crufix. Prophet of Crucifix untaps all your creatures and all your lands, regardless. And is five, uh, is five mana? Yeah, he's five mana as well, I think. Might be four, and might be just completely like, com confused down my head. But it's only a two, three. Right? This guy's better. Or at least could be better. I think on a whole, Prophet of Crucifix is what you want to be playing if you just want to be uh, untapping things. Irregardless, you play it on tap, flash. Oh, and Prophet Acrifix actually should flash in things as well. So that's actually a big part of the argument I'm missing, which actually makes Prophet Acrifix better. But this is the closest card we can compare Ivory Tusk Fortress to. Ivory Tusk Fortress 2, uh, Fortress is, more, uh, I think, the same mana cost. I think the same mana cost. Um, I'll probably have another annotation here to say, no, I was wrong, or I'm talking out of nowhere. Um, and doesn't, like, it's not as easy to untap things. You have to have other things doing stuff. But this is in the clan colours of the Outlast. So your other creatures, if you're playing them, are going to be getting 1-1 one -one counters. Plus, Outlast taps you. Think about that. You're tapping to activate Outlast to put a 1-1 one -one counter on it. This guy allows you to untap all your stuff every turn. And when normally the good Outlast cards are going to be like, when you activate Outlast, not only do you get count on this, you get this. So there might be a green Outlast card, which whenever it outlasts, untap all land. So, if you were to combine this Ivory Tusk Fortress with a Outlast card, card that allows you to untap all your land when you outcast it, you're going to be activating Outlast for absolutely ages. Uh, next up, we have Thousand Winds. A six mana creature, elemental, four colorless, blue, blue. It's a rare and it's a five, six with flying and morph, five, blue, blue. So you place down for three, it's a two, two. You can flip it up for seven, five and blue, blue. Well, when it's uh, turned faced up, return all other tapped creatures to their owner's hands. Interesting. And I like, basically this card is interesting. It's an expensive morph flip up, so it doesn't do the one thing some morph cards do, which is allow you to play the card for cheaper over multiple turns. Like you pay, say, a 6-6 six, six, and you end up paying 7 mana overall, but you'll play it on turn 5, not turn 6, which can be arguably better. This uh, is more expensive way to play it. 
even the turn you want to flip it up is more expensive than just playing it normally. Uh, but it, it, its effect is interesting or terrible. It's either good or terrible. Uh, clearly, it's design, it, it's an ability that's designed to go here, uh, tempo them ridiculously hard. But it only tempers them if they're tapping their creatures. And the only way they're tapping their creatures is if they're either attacking you constantly, which by turn 7 generally means you're dead, or they're doing the outlast mechanic, which, okay, unravels all the work they've built into their outlast uh, cards, but stops them actually really doing anything of value. Or oh, it sort of stops you actually doing anything of value, because, okay, you're unraveling everything, but you're spending an entire turn just doing this? Okay, it can be a blowout. It's only against outlast. Well, oh, I think this card is going to be terrible. Or at least I don't think it's going to see much play. It's let me get my head around it. I've said multiple things. I've kind of gone against myself multiple times. Here. I've just realised that it is a good card. I mean, it shuts down Outlast quite hard, and it's a morph card. Which again, when we explain morph, well, uh, if I do a video explains morph, if you want that anyway, will be good. But I think you're paying too much for its ability, and I think it won't work most of the time. Therefore, I think this card won't see play. I think that you've got other cards that do other things better. Against the attackers, which are what you want to be sending to their own hands or whatever, you're going to be using Aphis Bats, which sends them to their deck and can be done for less mana. Better. Against Outlast, okay, this card is better, but I'm not sure Outlast will be that big a mechanic. Maybe wrong, but I don't think it will necessarily be that big a mechanic. That said, it's a stopgap check valve, I think, if Outlast becomes too big, or do you sideboard in against Outlast decks? Next up, we have the Dagger, and actually, I think I remembered, it's Mardu for Dagger, Cackling, uh, Enchantment. So it's a three mana, bla uh, red, black, white, or red, white, black. No, it's not Enchantment, it's the instant. Sorry, Cackling Doom, red, white, black, instant, rare. Cackling Doom deals two damage to each opponent. Each opponent sacrifices the creature with the greatest power among creatures he or she controls. This is a good card. In Burn, it's dealing two damage and getting rid of a creature. This is a good card. It's like, for Burn, it's good. Because the problem Burn has had is dealing damage to your opponent and removing creatures. The downside is they can kind of... Uh, you know, they kind of choose which creature it is. But it's a sacrifice. So if there are any really hard to deal with creatures, such as, say, Narset, this is an answer. Narset actually being kind of annoying because uh, she's got Hexproof. And she's going to be playing in a deck with very few creatures if she sees play. So this is a good answer to Narset and to other things. In fact, the ironic thing, though, is actually a really good answer to Zergo, especially if Zergo is the only, well, only if Zergo's the only thing on the board. But that's not a bad answer. Not a bad answer at all. But it also combos with Zergo, because if you attack with Zergo and they block, they lose a creature. Boom. But that then limits the amount of creatures they can have to sacrifice to Cackling do. So you attack, they block with a chump, ch cheap chunk they want to get rid of, making Zergo bigger. But he doesn't have Trample, so that doesn't matter. Then you just go Cackling do. Remove the big threat I was going to try and kill before, but I didn't have the spell, or you weren't going to block. Not a bad card. Burns and removal in three mana. I like that card. Next up, we have Jeskai Elder, another card that's been spoiled before, uh, or a couple a while ago. A Jeskai card. One colorless blue, so two mana, for a creature, human monk, uncommon. A one-two with prowess. And whenever it deals damage to a player, you may draw a card if you do discard a card. So it's a card that gives you filtering and can get big, uh, temporary bigger whenever you cast a non-creature spell. Great card. Uh, will it see play? Possibly. Definitely limited. Definitely limited bomb, by the way. And I really should... Actually, maybe I should mention limited for some of these other cards. Maybe not, actually. I care more about standard. But this will definitely see play in limited. And um, will possibly see play in standard, depending on how the format works. The problem is the Jeskai, the deck that wants to be playing this, probably aren't going to be wanting to play many creatures and probably don't need to or want to play a creature turn two. Not a bad card, but overall maybe not see played. Limited, yes. Constructed, iffy. 
Next up, however, we have the Mardu Skull Hunter. Two mana, one and black. So colors on black. Creature, human, warrior. Common. With, uh, it enters the battlefield tapped. But it's raid mechanic, which is the mechanic where if your creature, uh, a creature attacked that turn before you play things, it triggers them. So when Mardu Skull Hunter enters the battlefield, if you attack to a creature this turn, target opponent discards a card, and it's a 2-1. This card is amazing in aggro, and it will see lots of play in aggro. I play a one drop, attack. I play one drop turn one, attack you turn two, then play this. Great, and the rain mechanic just seems wonderful. Uh, like I haven't really said I really like any of the other mechanics, but this mechanic is great. It rewards you for play, uh, playing the way you should be playing. Like This rewards and encourages people to play the way the game should be played normally. We had Devotion, which encouraged you... Well, let's talk about this way. In Thelos, we had Devotion. They encouraged you to play things before combat to keep Devotion online for gods that were attacking. This requires you to uh, reward you for playing, the, or force you to play the other way, the kind of better way that more players have been playing uh, naturally uh, for a while, which is you attack, leaving up mana for combat tricks or representation, then you play any creatures you want, or any other non-instant uh, combat tricky things, combat, uh, main phase two. So now you're just doing that naturally, but you get rewarded when you do this with this mechanic. And discarding card is a big ability. Right? Yeah, okay, they choose a card, they discard, so it's not a card at random. But you got to think, this is in a deck colour with Thoughtseize. Right? So you could go, uh, turn one, play a creature. Turn two, attack, play this. Turn three, thought sees, attack, play another one of these. And you're just stripping the hand away. But this kind of thing, okay, it's not information. You're not getting information with thought, uh, this card, so they just discard anything they want. But you have to remember, this is also a creature. So you're beating them away with something that's already given you value by discarding a card. And two mana for them to discard a card isn't great, but when it's attached to a creature, it's not bad. And this is common. Oh boy, this is going to cause a lot of problems in uh, Limited, I can tell you. And in Constructed, yeah. Like, it does what Agro really want to do, which is dis make control decks discard cards. Because now that it's got the... Now that the Wizards have said they want all uh, all board wipes kind of be... Or all unconditional board wipes, so just destroy all creatures at five mana, the control decks need to hit five mana. So when you play this, they go like, do I discard a land, which is probably the card I'd normally need to discard, or do I discard one of these other kind of fuel... Uh, one of my other fuel cards, like my actual gas, the, the cards I can actually play. Do I discard one of them? Makes choices iffy for your opponent and really can actually punish bad players. Really good mechanic and I like, well, really good use of the raid mechanic, let's say in this case. Next card up, we have one of the uncommon ends of battlefield tap trilands, Mystic Monastery. And it just... Gives you blue, red, or white. So it's the Jeskai uh, uncommon mana fixing, which we were expecting based on the fact that this is kind of a wedge block, a wedge set, not block, wedge set, and this similar to basically uh, a lava. Next up, we have Mardu Heart Piercer. It's four mana, three, and a red. Creature, human archer, uncommon, with raid. When Mardu Heartpiercer enters the battlefield, if you attack with a creature this turn, Mardu Heartpiercer deals two damage to target creature or player to three. So, this is a less powerful Karu Flame Tongue, and you have to do more to work it. However, it is a semi decent creature, good in limited, not so good in constructed though, but this is a good limited card because it's enter battlefield effect. Um. Powerful card. I love. Uh, I like it. I just like the way it feels. I like the art. Two, three, four. Not great for an aggro deck, which is where you'd want to be playing raid. But overall, not a bad card. Definitely good for limited because it helps remove creatures out of the way and actually could theoretically deal with Zergo Helmet Smasher if you let him attack you once with it. And the fine. Uh, the next card up is the Nomad Outpost. Nomad Outpost, uh, which is the. Um, Mardu, so the Dega um, Enter Battlefield Tap Triland. And that is pretty much it. Yeah, that's every card covered. Um, overall, some really good spoilers right now. Uh, oh no, sorry, one more spoiler. Ooh, one more spoiler. Ugh. Don't know how I missed this. Um, 
Dragon Throne of Tarkir, a four mana legendary artifact equipment. Equipped creature has Defender and two and tap. So pay two and tap. Other creatures you control get trample and plus X plus X until end of turn with X as this creature's power. And it has a quick cost of three. Not a bad card. Not a great card. I don't know. It's not a terrible card overall, actually, but yeah. So that is official. Yeah, I've actually done all the spoilers now. I've done all the spoilers. Uh, overall, this card set, I don't know. I like it more than Felos. When Felos was first spoiled, I liked the theme. I liked the setting. The cards just never really got there. You had a few cards like Elspeth, but were only amazing because of the slower format. This set just feels a lot better. Though, a lot of that may be to do with the fetch lands. I agree, that may be it. But overall, this card, just what we saw so far, is actually looking quite promising. And they've even spoiled some dud rares in this. So, yeah, really good set so far. Really cool cards. Um, tell me what you think below. Now, my aim is that my aim, sorry, is actually to do spoilers fairly regularly uh, for this uh, set. So, unlike the other spoiler seasons I've tried doing and only done one or two days of, this time, this time I'm trying to do every single spoiler. So, subscribe, like, and comment, and I will keep doing spoilers. I will do a video on more from why I think it's good, and I will do a video on the changes to the standard format uh, when I get time. I am moving back to uni tomorrow. And won't get them until Tuesday, tidy in. So Wednesday will really be the day I can start doing any more filming. Unless I do some really late Tuesday night. So, don't forget to like, subscribe, watch the videos, uh, comment below. Uh, what do you think of the set? What do you think of these cards so far? What's your favourite card spoiled so far? And any videos you'd like to see uh, coming forward. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And I will definitely see you next time.